strategic plans and the largest trade free trade agreement in the world will shape the, the region going forward and with it with it, its, its investment opportunities. Um, in addition to this, uh, and uh, a special circumstance that makes this webinar around investment opportunities timely is China's shift to facilitate the investment from foreign players. Uh, China has traditionally segmented activities into four groups, the prohibited activities, restricted, allowed, and incentivized activities. Some of these activities are seeing a gradual shift to groups which are aimed to welcome and incentivize new investments uh, 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 opportunities uh, and for investors is uh, food and established uh, activities in China. Um, on September 25th this year, uh, the Chinese regulators jointly issued a series of measures targeted to China's qualified foreign institutional investors, expanding their permissible investment scopes and streamlining their, their applications and reviews processes, uh, thus offering a more convenient process for these players' investments in China's capital markets. While previously these players were allowed to invest in A shares, bonds, public securities, investment funds, and stock index futures, for the purpose of uh, foreign exchange hedging, they were also allowed to invest in certain foreign exchange derivatives. Under the new regulations, the list of permissible investment classes is expanded to include the shares traded in China's OTC boards, bonds, currencies, uh, and interest rate derivatives traded in the interbank market, the market which are approved by the People's Bank of China, depository receipts, repos, asset-backed securities, financial and commodity futures traded in, in Chinese exchanges and options. This is the first time that the qualified foreign uh, institutional investor ventures are allowed to invest in private securities investment funds, where the investment code, the scope conforms to the one I just mentioned. Finally, in the past, these schemes were not, also not open to hedge fund managers, but now the new regulations have expanded the scope of eligible applicants to include all types of asset managers, including hedge fund managers and uh, other financial institutions. Under these new regulations, foreign investors will enjoy an easier market access and a broader investment scope when investing via the qualified foreign institutional investment schemes. It is expected that the new regulations will encourage more medium and long term funds to enter the Chinese market directly and that uh, they will broaden the investor, investor base for financial and hedging instruments in China, which will increase the sophistication in China's markets and they will, this will push forward the other markets in Asia. In summary, as I said, a very timely moment for the presentations ahead. And with this, I would like to introduce our first distinguished speaker, yeah, Virginie Mazenev. Um, named top women in finance in, in finance in Europe in 2008, 2009, 2010, 11, 12, and 14. I guess uh, Virginie, you decided to give someone a chance on 30, 2013 uh, for this award. Uh, one of Money Management Executives 2014 Top Women in Asset Management, 2019 Investment Weekly Highly Commented International Investment Woman of the Year. As a global investment leader with a track record of over 30 years of performance in leadership and innovation, Virginie is the founder of MDA Consulting, as well as an advisory council member at the Future of Finance at the CFA Institute. She has held various portfolio management and CIO positions for companies such as Eastspring, Pinko, Shores, Taping Light, Battery March, State Street Research, and Martin Green in various parts of the world, including Singapore, New York, Boston, San Francisco, and London. She started her career in China, working as a consultant for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing, while attending political economy classes at People's University. As an investor, she's recognized as a pioneer in areas such as China, quantum mental, ESG, and climate change. Virginie is a member of the Future of Finance Council, CFA, and a high-profile public speaker and global media communicator. She's regularly interviewed by Bloomberg, CNBC, BBC, and is thought as a thought leader on topics such as global markets outlook, sustainability, diversity, and creative disruption in the asset management industry. She was chair of the CFA UK Women's Network and is a founder member of the Bloomberg Women's Bison Network. Virginie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of getting uh, the slides, do you know who's putting them up? Um, Luis, are you, are you, 
are going to display the uh, the slides. Luis, are you there? Yes, yeah. yes, I'm doing it. Yes, just hold on a second. Oh, fantastic. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You were you were in the dark, so we didn't know whether. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. I can talk without the slides, but it's a little bit easier given the numbers. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you everybody for uh, being here today to discuss this topic of uh, Asia, which is so important and is very volatile time in the, uh, in the world and the market. So I'll share my, my views um, on Outlook 2021, particularly on the opportunities in, uh, in Asia. Um, so I think, uh, Louis, you will control the slides because I tried to move them forward. Yes, if we can go uh, one, one up. Yes, fantastic. Uh, so I call 2021 uh, finding a new balance in a VUCA world. And VUCA comes from an expression that I believe Cambridge uh, University has created, which is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And I thought that really, really qualifies well for 2021 as a follow-up of 2020. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Sorry, sorry, Virgin. Uh, please, por favor, hay una Joyce que tiene su micrófono abierto. ¿Lo puedes cerrar, por favor, que se escucha la conversación? <laughs> Okay, sorry, very, sorry, Virgin. You can okay. go ahead. So I've lost my. I'm. I'm. Uh, okay. Excellent. Thank you. So when I think of the outlook, uh, I always think of tailwinds and and headwinds. Uh, it helps me think, and I think thinking about this 2021 outlook. Uh, Asia is actually really well placed. So in terms of tailwinds, I'll talk about the Asian uh, center and Pablo has uh, kindly uh, also mentioned that in his introduction. Clearly we have liquidity that has been uh, very strong and supporting the market and is still there. Uh, in terms of engine of growth, we are in full transformation. So we have new technology, new consumption, transformation, building resilience, uh, mitigation and adaptation, finding more efficiency. So there are so many interesting themes uh, in the global markets where we can find ideas, even though markets have been up. And I think Asia is going to be a great source for those ideas. We also have green finance opportunities, and I'll talk about climate change a little bit. We clearly have a lower oil price, uh, which generally is supportive of, uh, of the, uh, the economy. We have a weaker dollar, which again is generally uh, supportive of the uh, economic cycle, and we have trade. And you will see that I also have trade in headwinds, and that is not uh, by chance. It's because trade will be, in my view, both a tailwind and a headwind. Clearly, in terms of headwinds, we'll have coping with debt, and you will see that Asia is actually better placed there than a lot of the other countries coping with COVID. Uh, even once we have vaccines, it's going to be really important. There's going to be really several uh, parts of the recovery. Who can distribute the vaccine? It's quite finicky in terms of uh, transportation and refrigeration. Who can bring it to its people? Who will have enough vaccines, uh, et cetera? So that's going to be the battle for 2021. To a geopolitics, uh, and that is linked to trade, but I think uh, beyond that, there are new geopolitics, and I really feel in the aftermath of the last four years in the US, uh, we might be surprised with some of the geopolitical volatility that we get. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I'll talk about the headwinds now, getting into uh, the next page. Thank you. Just a picture to uh, look at the liquidity. This is quite amazing and certainly never seen. I've been in, in asset management for 33 years. I have never seen that. So I wanted to put those charts. Uh, those come from uh, an organization called Cross Border who specializes on uh, measuring liquidity. And you can see how abnormal and how much liquidity has been put in the system. 
The chart on the lower right hand side is quite interesting because you can see how normally liquidity and asset prices really follow in a very correlated manner. And uh, in this case, it, it has not really matched that. So I believe markets have room to, uh, to go up some more. Uh, just to give you an idea, $24.2 trillion of liquidity injected. The U.S. clearly led at 1.4. Interestingly, in terms of balance sheet, ECB and BOE, that, uh, their, their expansion is about 40%. PBOC, which is China, is basically flat. So what that means is as we look into 2021, coping with the negative aspects of normalizing, if you want monetary policy, is gonna be much easier for China than some of the other countries. If we can uh, move on to the next page, please. Thank you. That is just, again, uh, another picture showing how much was injected, 10 trillion in the first two months, which is uh, higher, uh, three times higher than what we had during the GFC. So one of the things that's in favor of Asia is clearly demographics. And you can see, I like to have those, uh, that progression, and we could spend a whole hour on, on demographics, but you can see how from 2019 moving 2050, uh, Asia is really uh, taking the, that's what we call the, the Asian century, with both India and actually India surpassing uh, China in its population. Clearly, demographics drive uh, growth, economic growth. So this will be a supporting factor, but we also have to remember that some countries, uh, particularly Japan and China, are aging extremely rapidly. So uh, again, some, some negatives around there, but overall broadly are uh, positive. Uh, again, another picture. So uh, if you remember before the last uh, crisis, before the GFC, China was behind Japan. It took over Japan uh, after the GFC by staying more stable. And you can see now that on a PPP purchasing power parity basis, China is actually larger than the US. Uh, this is really interesting. I'd like to have that slide and also think about the gross financial assets of $200 trillion. Uh, just because when we talk about climate change, we know there'll need to be a lot of investments and there is money to invest uh, to help with this uh, very important issue. Uh, and and uh, 200 trillion is, is a lot of money. If we can allocate some of that capital uh, for good returns, uh, we will be able to, to deal with climate. So here again, just a picture by 2050, uh, half the world, over half the world population in Asia. Uh, just a graphic there in the interest of time, I'm just going to, uh, to go on. Uh, again, China and India soaring, emerging market expected to overtake the de developed market as the largest contributor to global GDP in 2042, representing 60% of global GDP by 2050. And here you have the classification on this chart, which is a, a Bloomberg chart <laughs> uh, that I found uh, very, very helpful. So now let's talk a little bit more about China. The thing that's interesting, well, most countries are still in very difficult positions. If you look at the US, if you look at Europe in terms of COVID, China has actually uh, basically uh, absorbed the COVID shop. And in October, the numbers are basically, we're back to pre-COVID. Uh, so if charts, you can see that from a, a savings uh, level, China is has a lot of savings versus other countries. Even if we look at growth on the lower uh, left corner, you can see China is going to be one of the only country in the world to have positive growth. Uh, it will, it is working, and we'll discuss that a bit later on balancing domestic and international through its new uh, 14th five-year plan. It has targeted net zero by 2060, and it's really powering up uh, innovation and technology uh, to drive growth in the next five to 10 years. Uh, size matters. So as we discussed in 2020, uh, we estimate China to get to 15, about $15 trillion, which is gonna be larger than Europe. 
since 2016, we've taken 55 million out of poverty. So it's, it's not only uh, about GDP, it's also about people. And the G digital economy is 35% of GDP. So this is really critical to think about how we, we think about investment in the future. Clearly consumption and urbanization uh, are leading 60% uh, of GDP uh, from uh, consumption since, since 2016. Uh, middle class population, uh, 800 million by 2035. One of the things that I find really powerful is what I call tech power. So as you know, 5G is going to be very important to power up economies to achieve that next phase of growth in an efficient and less carbon intensive manner. And China is very, very well placed there. Um, as I mentioned, the negative shock of COVID in service in the service area is still being felt, but overall for the economy, we're back to pre-COVID. So looking forward, uh, China tends to work uh, in five-year plans and even beyond. Uh, and I remember when I lived in China, I thought those plans were always so helpful in understanding uh, the economy. Uh, it is planning to be at economic parity with the U.S. by 2035. Uh, it is promoting this double circulation policy, which is not only the result of the Trump years on trade. Uh, that actually is a concept that was born and, and already was present in the previous five years plan, five year plan, but has been accelerated. And basically what that means is more self-reliance in terms of technology, uh, environmental protection, but also powering itself. So the energy policy is gonna be extremely important. Infrastructure in the broad sense development, particularly around smart city, internet of things, mass transit. We talked about 5G data, artificial intelligence. That is what is gonna be driving a lot of the growth and food security. And as we know, with the, the past of, uh, of, of China, food security is very, uh, very much a focus of, of the country. Uh, national defense as well. So talking about geopolitics and uh, volatility, I think that this is something that will have to be prepared, particularly with its uh, foothold in the South China Sea. It also wants to increase soft power. Uh, but it has a demographic bombshell, and here you have some of the numbers, and we highlighted that in the introduction. So we talk about global trade. Uh, clearly, WTO was a major event for China and propelled China to, to the, the kind of large economic power that it was. But now with the double circulation, and with the new trade sign that uh, we call the RCEP, uh, you also have new elements to, 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 to understand how trade is gonna change. Of course, with the Biden administration, trend is gonna, trade is gonna normalize to a certain extent, but I think you'll also have Biden working with Europe and other countries to try to ask China uh, to uh, make some changes in some aspects of its trade policy. So the problems are not going to be away. Uh, in the meantime, China is really flexing its muscle in Asia, taking the lead. Uh, China today said it might want to join uh, TPP, so that's also interesting, and that's definitely uh, something to pay attention to. Just a few numbers that I thought was very interesting. As we think of China withdrawing uh, on balance, uh, it turning more inward to source more part of its growth uh, and having net uh, from net exports, less from net exports, the impact on the world could be extremely large. And this exercise that was done here uh, forecast that it could be as much as 22 to 37 trillion uh, dollars of GDP by 2040 if China's net trade surplus basically continues to shrink and she focuses more inward. So now I'd like to talk about the headwinds and challenges so that we can now uh, just move on. Clearly, we talked about the aftermath of all this liquidity. So uh, deficit, uh, you know, budget deficits are completely uh, 
going up very, very strongly. So 16% uh, for the US, we've not seen that since 1945. Uh, in Europe, we're at 10%. Uh, China, again, is better placed there, but uh, even emerging markets overall, we are above 7%. So once we have the vaccine, you're going to see the markets focusing on this. And if you notice what happened uh, around the Treasury Fed discussion uh, that took place just a few days ago, we will have markets really think about what happens in this normalization. How do we take back those emergency measures that we've seen? And we're going to have to figure out whose market is going to be most impacted. Clearly, I believe China is in a very good spot because it did not inject as much as other, other people, other countries. If we can move on, please. So to me, the biggest challenge is one that I've talked about for a long time. And because it's a long term, we tend to focus on short term crisis. And of course, we have to. But the long-term aspect of climate change is going to become short-term very quickly. And the reason is that climate change is a cumulative event. Uh, and a cumulative event means that the carbon uh, that we have today was emitted maybe 10 years ago and continues to have an impact. It's very clear that the current global economic model uh, is uh, very carbon intensive and is very unsustainable, as you can see on this chart. We are at a crossroad, so those are some of the numbers. Uh, I am not a climate scientist, but I read a lot of things that uh, climate scientists write. And the one thing that's really important is that on a BAU business as usual basis, we are going to a three to four degree increase, which means that uh, warming by 2100. And remember, it's a cumulative event. So if we pass a certain cap, it's gonna be very difficult uh, to change the trajectory. Uh, people say one to three meter of ocean level higher. Uh, when we were at five to six degrees colder, the ocean level was at 106 meters below what they are today. It doesn't mean that this is gonna be a symmetrical equation, but I do believe that the forecast of one to three meters are vastly underestimated. The difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees is also very important. We could have a whole session of that. I'm not going to talk too much in detail about this, but this is really important to understand the challenge. This is also a huge business opportunities because clearly everybody is going to try to mitigate and adapt. And it's going to be, uh, I, I believe, room for, for very strong returns in that area. So if we can move on, please. Very quickly, I wanted to remind us, so clearly the largest emitter is China, uh, then the US and then Europe. Uh, Europe has actually, uh, these emissions have been down 20% since 1990. Uh, India is growing very rapidly uh, and China uh, is expecting to peak by 2030, but that's still a long time away. If we can move on, perhaps, perhaps uh, if we could put ourselves on mute, that would be uh, that would be good. There you are. There you are. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, in terms of CO2 contributors, we've seen China is the largest, but actually, when you look at it per capita and on a cumulative basis, the U.S. is really at the forefront. So when the U.S. says China is not doing anything, this is not true. Both China and the U.S. must really tackle this for all of us, the, the global economy, to do well. Let, let's move on to the next, uh, next page. Now, in terms of Asia and climate change, what does that mean? Asia is actually quite exposed. Now, Asia is a very big place. Uh, and if you are in, uh, you know, in, in Bangladesh, it's going to be very different than if you're in Japan. And it's a very, very big space. But generally, sea level and ocean warming happens twice as fast in Asia than in other parts of the world. We also have a very high concentration of people who live in coastal areas and the urbanization trends is taking place around coastal areas uh, in, uh, in Asia. And of course, with flooding, uh, that's gonna be at risk. Um, it will exacerbate food 
uh, it will have irreversible uh, impact. And of course, water uh, is also very much uh, at the forefront of uh, government and, and leaders when thinking about climate change. So in the case of China, as we've seen, China is nearly a, a dragon with two heads. On one hand, it's pledging 2030, 2060 net zero. On the other hand, it still has a lot of coal. Now with this new five-year plan, you will see a lot of investment going into wind and solar. And China is already a very lo the largest investor uh, in solar uh, capacity, so this is good, but it needs to accelerate its transition. So again, from an investor standpoint, there will be a lot of opportunities in renewable in, in China. In the case of India, uh, very difficult. Again, India is very dependent on coal. It also has a very large farming population and 15% of the global cattle population, which is very uh, carbon intensive, is, if I can say it this way. Uh, it has pledged a lot at COP21 on to uh, renewable, but there is a lot of work to do. And of course, one of the difficulties is not everybody is being affected the same way. Some people actually benefit uh, from an economic standpoint from climate and others are hurt uh, quite dramatically. So now let's talk about opportunities, um, if we can move on. One of the big opportunity and for a sustainable investor uh, that I've been for most of the past 30 years, I think this is something that has grown from basically zero to uh, trillions uh, of assets. I think that investing on a sustainable manner uh, is, is not about being green, it's about finding quality, resilience, uh, efficiency and long-term model of sustainability that will benefit investors as well as the environment. You can see how because of COVID, there's been nearly an awareness, a heightened awareness around sustainability. And here just a few charts to show you how much more assets versus before have flown into uh, sustainable. So we have more green bonds, social bonds, more interest in uh, ESG stock investing, which is all very good news. And interestingly, the quality aspect of ESG has really helped uh, with performance uh, during the COVID time. I'd like to uh, basically finish on opportunities. Uh, I believe some of the strongest opportunities that you can find uh, in globally and in Asia are around technology and AI, uh, particularly around, for example, cloud connectivity. We know that's going to be a big focus of the new five-year plan. Uh, food, crop and management that also in light of climate change, a lot of investment in vertical farming, for example, and other technology, tech food, if you want, is going to offer opportunities. Energy, and here I don't mean uh, fossil, I mean a lot of, uh, you know, connection, power grid, renewable, but also how do we bring that, how do we use renewable to basically keep the same standards of living uh, at a time where battery technology is still very much in its infancy. New finance, new consumption. I strongly believe that even once COVID vaccines are back, or we will remain with a hybrid model, more, uh, more digitalization, more online, uh, and uh, that, that will stay with us and this will create new consumption. Infrastructure, is a very, very big theme. I think sustainable infrastructure is going to be a huge area of investment in a very low rate environment that will provide attractive yield for investors. We have a funding gap uh, of 15 to 18 trillion to 2040 for infrastructure on a global basis. And that's thinking out of a $97 trillion investment that is estimated to be needed to reach the social uh, development goals, the SDG. Water is a big area with a lot of waste and with climate, as we know, uh, water uh, will become scarce in some area and access to water. Smart city is a theme that I really, really like, particularly when it's linked to energy uh, and transport and mobility. Uh, again, China will lead in uh, EV uh, and, uh, and battery technology. 
um, we can move on. Energy, and there we, I'm probably running out of time, so I'm gonna stop, but those two slides are really interesting. A sector like energy, ProSol, uh, energy in particular, uh, is into a very difficult spot. But actually, if you put artificial intelligence and a lot of digital technology into uh, traditional energy, there is a lot of saving uh, that can be had, and there's also a lot of reduction in carbon. So I think it's very important to bring innovation in everything we look at. If we can move on to the next slide, which is also on, on, on energy. Again, um, you know, that's really more for your information. And that's the uh, end of my uh, comments uh, today. Thank you so much, uh, Virginie. That's uh, was a very interesting and very informative uh, presentation. Um, I remind the audience that after our second presentation, we'll have a round of Q&A and that you please send your questions via the chat feature. And before I move on into our next speaker, there's one specific question, very easy, and I think it should be, it's, it's, it, it's, it's better for us to, to discuss it now. Uh, there's a question regarding what, what you meant by new finance. New finance, uh, I mean fintech. I basically mean the role of finance as we have it, but delivered in, in other ways. So think about, uh, think about the insurance uh, sector, for example. The insurance sector is gonna be transformed. The way we price risk is gonna change for several reasons. One, with climate, you're gonna have new disease. If you look at uh, properties, everything is gonna change. And the thing about insurance companies is they look at very long-term actuarial tables. Well, actually the most recent 10 years should be in my view weighted much more heavily because of the change, the accelerated of change. But you can also think about how they can be transforming themselves. You will have, for example, car insurance that uh, allows you to get your claims really if you have an accident and you have internet of things linked onto your, your car, uh, you could be taking a picture of the uh, damaged area and by the time you get home, uh, if there's enough information, uh, have your reimbursement in your bank account. That's what I mean by new finance. The finance sector is functioning basically like it was, you know, 40, 50 years ago, and technology now is going to power it forward, and we're going to see a lot of new opportunities in that area. Thank you, Virginia. Yeah, that were quite indeed. I think we can actually uh, expand on that on, on the Q&A session. I think that a blockchain and uh, intelligent contracts apply to what, uh, uh, the example of, as you just said, on, on insurance are definitely uh, going to lead uh, the, the way into new industries coming forward and new solutions. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. And we yeah. will expand that on, on, on the Q&A session. Now, moving on, uh, I'd like to introduce you to our second speaker, uh, Michael Tyler. Uh, Michael Tyler is uh, Managing Director for Moody's Investor Services. Uh, he's also Moody's Chief Credit Officer for the Asia Pacific region. Michael leads uh, regional research, particular, particularly with a cross-sectoral and macro credit focus, uh, as well as coordinated, coordinating a major uh, regional analytical uh, initiatives. Michael joined Moody's after a distinguished career in several leading central banks and international financial institutions, including uh, roles at the Bank of England, the IMF, where as president representative, he was closely involved in the resolution of the Indonesian uh, financial crisis in the late 1990s, and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority as head of uh, banking policy. He was also the advisor to the governor of the Central Bank of Bahrain. Uh, Michael has also had a distinguished academic career, including as a reader in uh, financial regulation uh, at Reading University, he has published widely on financial stability and financial regulation and given seminars and lectures as, uh, at the same business school at Oxford University and uh, Harvard Law School, Columbia University and the University of Hong Kong. Michael holds a bachelor's degree as well as a doctorate from Oxford University. He also holds a master's uh, in international business law from the University of London. Michael, the floor is yours. 
Uh, thank you very much, Pablo, and, and thank you also to uh, the Fundacion and, for, and to Bergini, whose uh, presentation um, has covered an awful lot of ground. Uh, I'm going to uh, give a presentation. Uh, I'll speak for about 20 minutes to try to allow us to, to have enough time for, uh, for Q&A. Um, Luis, are you going to share your screen again, or I can share yes. my screen? Okay. So maybe if we start with the presentation, um, obviously uh, from, from the perspective of, of Moody's Investors Service, uh, we are a credit rating agency. So I'm coming at this from a credit background. Uh, and as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, credit people are professional pessimists. So I'm going to be talking less about uh, investment opportunities uh, and more about some of the, the challenges around the region. Um, although that said, I think uh, the uh, Asia Pacific region is one which is going to continue to outperform other regions for, uh, for some considerable time yet. Uh, if we just move to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk about three main topics. The first one is the, the nature of the global recovery, which is it's asymmetric. I, there, there are parts of the world which are recovering fairly strongly and others which are uh, still suffering the effects of the coronavirus pandemic uh, and are, are not seeing very strong recoveries. Uh, secondly, Asia as a whole, if we could just stay with that slide for a moment, Asia as a whole is in a relatively better position compared to other regions. Um, and that has to do also with the control of the epidemic uh, and the way in which uh, many governments in Asia have been very effective in terms of uh, controlling the outbreak. And then finally, uh, I'm going to talk about the way in which coronavirus is going to accelerate some fundamental shifts in the coming years. So moving now to the first of those topics, if we move on to the uh, next slide and the slide after that. So um, this is our forecast for the G20 economies. Um, and as you can see, uh, in Pretty much all of the G20 this year, we're, we are forecasting a, a quite significant contraction. The numbers are in green because they, they are actually, the contraction is slightly less severe than we'd forecast in the third quarter of the year. But nonetheless, we're still expecting to see quite a severe contraction. The only country, and again, this goes to a point that Virginia has already made, uh, the only major economy which is posting positive growth this year is China where we're forecasting 2.2% growth. Um, going into 2021 and 2022, uh, while we're seeing something of a recovery, it's still a relatively slow one. And we think it's going to be sometime in 2022 before most of the major economies have recovered to the same level of output that they had at the end of 2019 before the coronavirus pandemic spread to the rest of the world. If we move to the next slide. Uh, could we go back one slide? Okay, so um, no, no, that's fine. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so the, the, there are some quite significant um, upside and downside factors to, to take into account in these forecasts. Um, early distribution of an effective vaccine uh, is something which has come into uh, people's awareness in, in the last couple of weeks. I mean, we've, we've seen some quite positive news around vaccines. Our view is that it's still going to take some time for the vaccines to be widely distributed. So we, we don't anticipate that there will be any major positive economic effects from uh, a vaccination campaign until sometime in the middle of 2021 at the earliest. Um, as Virginie also talked about in her presentation, we're seeing sizable fiscal and monetary policy support. Um, and in addition, um, if we see a, a resolution in, in some of the trade disputes, or if we see faster than expected growth in China and the US next year, then that clearly has some upside to our economic forecast. However, I think the, the greater weight of, of the, the forecast is on the downside, um, particularly the first of these points about the virus resurgence requiring repeated lockdowns uh, in which case um, there will be 
uh, some negative economic effect, effects. And we think that there is a, a risk of a double dip recession in uh, the US and Europe, and that risk has grown uh, because the, uh, the, the spread of the virus. So um, there, there are quite a number of, of downside factors to our forecast. So um, it's certainly a very uneven and slow recovery that we're looking at into 2021 and 2022. Next slide, please. The good news is that for Asia, uh, it, it will continue to outperform the uh, other major economic regions of the world. Asia has been the fastest growing economic region in the world for, for some time now. We think that's going to remain the case. The average growth rate in Asia is going to be lower than it was pre-COVID. Um, and that there has, as you can see from, from this slide, there will be quite a number of economies which are slow grower growing more slowly uh, than they did on average in the past five years. Nonetheless, if you compare the APAC average, which is that orange bubble somewhere around about the middle of the chart to the averages for, for other major economic regions, as you can see, APAC is sub substantially outperforming Europe. It's sub substantially outperforming Latin America in terms of average growth rates. So even in a post-COVID environment, we think that Asia is going to be one of the standouts in terms of growth. Next slide, please. But there is quite a lot of variation across Asia's economies. Uh, as you can see, as you move towards the lower left-hand corner, uh, those are the economies where the economic impact is going to be greatest and longest lasting. Uh, uh, an economy like the Maldives, for example, which is very tourism dependent, has received some, some very uh, significant negative impact from coronavirus. But there are, as you see in the top right hand corner, a number of economies in the region which have uh, the potential to outperform. Um, and those are uh, ones which are closely embedded in regional supply chains. China, of course, where we're seeing the only major economy to register positive growth this year. But also it's, it's positive for, for a country like Vietnam. It's uh, positive for an economy like Taiwan, um, where again, the integration in supply chains is uh, helping those economies to weather the storm and to record strong economic growth going forward. Next slide, please. Um, we are seeing um, some ta tapering off in both um, FDI and portfolio investments, um, less so in FDI, um, which is shifting in terms of, of, of its composition. It's moving away from China, it's moving towards some of the countries in Southeast Asia, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Uh, but F FDI has held up relatively well, um, although it's now going to different countries. But as we saw, uh, as the um, financial market volatility hit in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak of COVID. Um, there have been some quite significant portfolio outflows from the region, although over time with the, uh, the, the growth potential of the region, we would expect some of those portfolio flows to, to reverse and to start coming back. Next slide. And as, if we look at the impact in terms of commodities prices, um, COVID has obviously had quite a, a differentiated impact in terms of commodities prices. Oil remains very, sub, uh, the oil price is very subdued compared to a pre-COVID situation. However, for some um, metals, we have seen quite a strong rebound. Um, and that's particularly the case for iron ore, for nickel, um, and for gold. Uh, for some other um, metals, uh, the position is more or less flat compared to, to 2019. So again, it's a slight, it's a story of some differentiation uh, in, in, the metal, in the metal space. Uh, next slide. So moving now to the, um, to the looking at in a bit more detail at three major economies from the region. Next slide, China. Um, the, the recovery in China has been quite strong. Um, it, it is policy driven, but the, the policy has been very different to what we saw in the post-global financial crisis period when we saw a very strong impulse 
from infrastructure-led investment. This time around, there has been some infrastructure investment, but it hasn't really been the main driver. Um, the monetary policy stance has also remained pretty much unchanged. Now, again, a point that Fashini made in her presentation, uh, the People's Bank of China has not relaxed monetary policy to anything like the extent that we've seen uh, in other major economies. So the, the rebound is, is policy-led. Uh, the, uh, the infrastructure spending that has been going on is much more targeted than it was in 2009. It's uh, also focusing on different things. In, in 2009, the focus was very much in terms of building physical infrastructure, railways, roads, bridges. Uh, now there is a focus on the Internet of Things, on 5G, uh, on building the, the infra, a smart infrastructure for China. Uh, and that's been very much the focus of, of the infrastructure investment to date. Next slide, please. Um, Indian growth has mo moderated quite substantially. Um, and the coronavirus outbreak has had some impact uh, on that. We have seen, though, even before the coronavirus outbreak, growth in India was slowing. Um, and I think one of the big questions, we, we have India uh, on negative outlook at the moment, it's just above um, uh, speculative grade. It's, it's, it's a, a, the lowest notch of investment grade ratings uh, that we have, which is BAA3. Um, and one of the issues that we're looking at is how strong a rebound are we going to see in terms of India's economy going forward? Because without a strong rebound, the debt to GDP ratio doesn't stabilize uh, and the uh, debt to GDP is going to grow um, in, in India, which would have various kinds of negative uh, credit implications for us. And next slide. And then Indonesia. Um, Indonesia's growth has been uh, slowing again, uh, again pre-COVID. Uh, it has taken something of a, a hit from, from COVID in addition. Um, it's one of those countries which ought to be in a position to pick up some of the transfer of labor-intensive manufacturing away from China. But it's, it's substantially failed to do so, so far, partly because of weak infrastructure. And that's also an issue with India, too. Uh, the present government in Indonesia is looking to try to uh, improve infrastructure. It's also introduced some recent legislation around labor markets, which remain very highly regulated. Um, but Indonesia has, so far at least, failed really to um, benefit from, from some of the shifts in, in trade, which I'll talk about in the final section. So moving now to that final section, um, next slide. Uh, this, these are six big themes that we think are going to shape credit over the coming years as a result of the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about all of them. So I'm going to concentrate on one of them, which is the global trade fragmentation story. And that we think is going to be a major issue as far as Asia Pacific is concerned. Uh, if we move on to the next slide. Uh, for many major economies, we think that the, um, the long term growth is going to suffer as a result of coronavirus. There is uh, some significant economic scarring taking place. Um, that will reduce growth prospects across a wide number of economies. And I've already talked about how in Asia Pacific, even though the, the region will outperform other parts of the world, growth is going to be slower uh, going forward than it was in the previous five years. Um, so that, that is obviously a, um, a risk. Interest rates are going to stay lower for longer and longer. So the, um, the substantial liquidity support that we're seeing for financial assets, which Virginie talked about, we, we expect to remain in place for, for several years yet. And then moving on to the next slide, this is really the key issue that I'd like to conclude with, which is that global trade is going to become more fragmented. Um, and, and that's to do with a reconfiguration of supply chains post COVID. Um, companies are increasingly, increasingly focused on the security of supply. They can achieve that in one of two ways. One is to bring in uh, the supply chains much closer to the final market, and we're seeing some of that happening, but also diversification of supply chains. 
And that's one of the reasons why um, we're seeing some benefits for Southeast Asia in particular as a result of the post-coronavirus situation, as well as the trade war between the US and China. If we move to the next slide, um, China's exports to the US were already declining before the trade tensions surfaced. There was already some shift going on to Asia ex China, particularly in Southeast Asia. Um, and we think that that is going to continue and, and the coronavirus will be an accelerant of, of that process. And moving to the next slide, and that has primarily benefited ASEAN countries. So the chief beneficiaries of uh, US China trade wars and post coronavirus trade reconfiguration are going to be in Southeast Asia. It's countries like Vietnam, which is, I think, one of the standout performers this year. It's also countries like Malaysia, Thailand, uh, where we're seeing some shift in productive capacity out of China uh, and into those countries. And, it, and, and in those countries, it's production mainly for export. Uh, in China's case, China still remains very deeply integrated in global supply chains, but increasingly companies are looking to their uh, productive capacity in China as manufacturing for China. So this comes back to the, the point about dual circulation, which, which Fujini was, was also talking about. So those are the main points that I have to make. Um, uh, old age dependency ratio is going to increase and, and I mean, again Virginie talked about uh, demographics uh, for some of the um, countries in Asia it is quite negative going forward especially countries like Japan which is well known but also Korea um, but overall uh, the growth story for Asia remains intact it will grow more slowly than in, in the past but it's still going to outperform others. and with that I'll hand back to you Pablo. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Two very uh, interesting and uh, complementary presentations. Uh, thank you so much for those. Um, we're moving now into the Q&A session. Uh, I look forward for a very interesting conversation. Uh, I remind everybody that uh, you can use the chat feature to send uh, some uh, questions of your, on, on your own. Um, I'd like to start by uh, concentrating on two aspects uh, that I feel I think they are key and they're very very timely to discuss. Uh, one is the, the Chinese uh, paradigm shift uh, around dual circulation, and the other is the RCEP, the uh, the trade uh, the trade agree recent trade agreement in in the Asian region. Um, regarding dual circulation, uh, China's dual circulation uh, strategy focuses on cutting its dependence on overseas markets and technology uh, in its long-term development. The dual circulation strategy uh, could become a key priority uh, in the government's 14th uh, five-year plan uh, that is going to be um, unveiled in the, during the annual parliament session in, 20, in early 2021. In, in last Friday's uh, speech at the, uh, the, AP, uh, the APEC uh, CEO Dialogues Conference, uh, President Xi Jinping said that China will pursue higher quality growth through this new model uh, driven by domestic demand and technological innovation. He said China would endeavor to build an innovation system that integrates science and technology, education industries and the financial sector and upgrade the industry and change, uh, the industry change. Uh, sustainability will also be a core focus. On the domestic cycle, China needs to boost household incomes and consumption. A key would be its ongoing urbanization program to turn millions of migrant workers into city dwellers to expand China's middle class. About 60% of China's population lives in urban, in urban areas. Uh, on the supply chain front, China has boasted the most complete manufacturing supply chains in the world of by foreign companies. However, tension with the United States, States has exposed China's vulnerability as it relies heavily on U.S. high-tech products, such as semiconductors, uh, for, forcing Beijing to support domestic innovation in efforts to secure domestic supply chains. Under this uh, dual circulation strategy, uh, she aims to boost tech innovation and push Chinese firms uh, up the global chain value chain. Uh, the global value chain, uh, key to globalizing China, China's uh, homegrown companies, boosting house, household incomes, and in turn stimulating 
uh, domestic de demand. So in this context, um, I would like to um, ask um, Virginie, does this paradigm shift, as President Xi Jinping calls it, present an opportunity for investing in technology firms in China and neighboring economies? And what about other industries? Uh, you actually mentioned that on one of your slides. I was wondering if you could expand specifically on the technology side, but also which other industries might have the largest upside potential in this context of the dual uh, circulation. Yes, uh, thank, you. I, 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 thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So I think uh, clearly there are many, many uh, companies now listed on the uh, on the market in China and in Hong Kong, as well as in the US, right? So uh, the areas that I am interested in are, of course, the digital consumption. So, you know, those are not new names. You have the Alibaba and, and all, all of this, right? Uh, on digital consumption, I will also link in uh, the whole gaming platform. Uh, that's very interesting. I like uh, all the architecture elements. So, uh, for example, the cloud ar architecture is going to have to be really strengthened. And Michael mentioned as well, uh, the whole 5G, all that build up, all that infrastructure build up, I think is, is absolutely fantastic. And of course, there you still have to be very careful on who you trust, you know, in the market. Uh, I tend to be quite conservative and go with the uh, names that are a little bit bigger. Uh, if they are associated with uh, government entities, making sure that they uh, understand, you know, market uh, market principles, etc. So I like the cloud. I like the digitalization as well, which is part of the new consumption theme. So uh, how do you bring consumption to 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 clients or to customers? And of course, there's the whole uh, Internet of Things. Uh, as you know, China has more facial recognition, for example, than uh, than uh, any other country in the world. There's a lot of technology there. Uh, so if you think of how smart cities, smart transit, as well as Internet of Things, how things get measured and how much more efficient, all of this is really, uh, really interesting. It will make what China needs to do to transfer to this lower carbon model is really to accelerate this uh, technology uh, transformation. And I wrote a paper about two, two and a half years ago called uh, Geopolitical Darwinism. Uh, and I, I clearly didn't know that the trade wars and everything would become so, so uh, acidic, if you want. But you could really see how uh, you know, as Putin said it, who controls AI controls the world. So there is a race, there's an arms race around gathering the most tools and supremacy, if you want, uh, the most command of uh, technology, but not basic technology. It's, it's about artificial intelligence, digitalization, being able to be more efficient, more agile. Uh, that, of, of course, also links into uh, defense and, and armaments, right? That is what the race is about. The race is not about corn or soybean. This is what this is about. And as you know, the last trade war, uh, a lot of blockage happened around technology and for China not to be able to import technology from the US and from Europe and for the world not to take 5G technology from China. This is going to stay. And China will invest massively in upgrading the area where it has a lot of uh, weaknesses, to be honest, around semiconductors, but also continue to build on areas where it has a lot of strength. Uh, and that's all around the, the themes that I've talked about. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll add a couple of thoughts to that. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree with, with many of the points that Virginia has raised. Um, I mean, I, I think what we've been looking at is best characterized as a trade plus tech war. Um, in that this, and I, I, I very much agree, this isn't just about trade, um, but, but technology, and in particular, um, access to sensitive technologies, which are at the, the cutting edge of the next industrial revolution is, is very much part of the tension between the US and China at the moment. Uh, clearly, the dual circulation theory 
uh, is, in some ways, it builds on um, uh, an approach which has been announced a few years ago, where China talked about Made in China 2025 uh, as an objective of uh, an industrial policy. Uh, and the, the intention there was to move up the, the industrial value chain to move into some of these future industries. Uh, and I think in some ways dual circulation is, is, is an extension of, of that approach. There is a challenge for China in terms of building the capacity to manufacture semiconductors. Um, the foundries which exist in China are not of the highest technology yet. Um, those tend to be in the US and also there are some in Taiwan as well. Uh, China hasn't yet to replicate the, the ability of those foundries to, to produce the very highest quality um, uh, and the most advanced semiconductors. The, the strategy around dual circulation is effectively an import substitution strategy in that what China is doing is it's developing its own domestic capacity. In the short term, that, work, that may be negative in the sense that finding domestic substitutes for some of these um, technologies uh, is not going to be an easy task. It's going to require substantial investment. Over the longer term, those investments may, may pay off. But certainly there could be some drag uh, on growth uh, in the near term as, as China looks to try to build up that capacity, which it doesn't yet have. And, and during this process, uh, in which, as you said, that the import substitution may take a little while to be implemented, is uh, do you think that um, the demand that is going to be uh, channeled through, uh, by, by China is, is an opportunity for some of the neighboring countries? Uh, we'll get into commodity prices and consumption in a minute, but uh, in general, in, in, within the, uh, the, uh, the, the other industries, do you think there's uh, any opportunity for some of the neighboring countries to step in and, and benefit from this transition? Yes, very much so. And, and I think we're already seeing that. Uh, one, one of the consequences of the trade war was that a number of, quite a number of companies, including some Chinese companies, incidentally, started to follow what was called a China plus one strategy. So it was, it was manufacturing in China and then one other country in the region. And that one other country, um, in many cases, was Vietnam. And Vietnam has been a major beneficiary from this process. Uh, there has been you know, some benefit also secondarily to countries like Malaysia and Thailand. The, the big constraint in terms of the shift in, in industrial capacity is, first of all, the sheer scale of the capacity in China. I mean, it is not easy to... Re replace the vast uh, industrial structure which exists in China at the moment. You know, if you take the train from Hong Kong to Guangzhou, um, you know, which is about a two hour train ride, I mean, you just pass factory after factory after factory, and that's one small part of China. Um, it, is a, it is almost impossible to replicate that scale in any other country in the region. What we're seeing though is some shift uh, to some of these other countries, but it's constrained also by infrastructure. Uh, and you know, it, it's possible to manufacture in those countries, but then getting the goods to market, putting them on, on a ship, shipping them off to the final market, that's more difficult. And, and that's one of the factors which has constrained, for example, a country like Indonesia from picking up some of this uh, lower value added manufacturing, because although labor costs there are, there are much lower than they are in China, uh, the infrastructure for export is, is not there either. Thank you. Virginie, would you like to expand on that? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with uh, everything Michael said. One question I have um, is how will the new trade deal impact? Because China does things in a very mindful and thoughtful manner. And if you read the fine line, and, and it's difficult to have all the details about the RCEP yet, but you have countries like Japan, who clearly are very advanced from a technology standpoint and, and semiconductor as well, right? And you also have, uh, it's going to be simplifying how people trade within the region. 
particularly where you have uh, products that are partly made here, partly made here, is going to be much simpler. And I think personally that the acceleration, while well, this deal has been in negotiation for eight years, but the timing of the signing, I think is quite interesting. And I think that when you think that this region basically manufactures 70% of the world's electronics, I think there has to be something in the background about helping China with uh, the difficult part, its difficulties in technology. Uh, and in semiconductors. Uh, we have to remember, you know, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, I mean, you know, Japan is, is included there. So I don't know exactly how, because it's, it's brand new, but I, I think it will help China around the technology gaps. Thank you. We'll get back into RCEP in a minute, uh, uh, but I do have a question regarding, uh, that I sort of anticipated to Michael, regarding the dual circulation, and, and you did mention on one of your slides, uh, the um, commodity prices. Do you expect this model to affect commodity, certain commodity prices in a way? Uh, probably not so much as um, China's stimulus package back in the 2009 at the time of the global financial crisis did. I mean, that was, I think, one of the big drivers of commodities prices for, for the decade that followed. Um, with the dual circulation theory, I mean, it, it's now, China's requirements for raw materials are not going to be fundamentally changed, I think, by, by dual circulation. It's primarily about manufacturing for the domestic market rather than for export. So it's a, it's a shift in focus. I don't think that that would have a, a big impact in terms of the demand for commodities vis-a-vis -vis a manufacturing for export strategy. Where I do think there could be some impact is in terms of where those raw materials are sourced. Um, I mean, RCEP is one way in which you know, some countries might stand to benefit, although we think the benefits for a country like Australia are going to be fairly limited. On the other hand, there's also the Belt and Road Initiative, the BRI, which is China's big infrastructure investment program, which now involves about 139 countries. About 64% of the exports of BRI countries to China take the form of commodities. So basically what they're doing is exporting raw materials to China along infrastructure that China has built. And I think the BRI is one of the potential game changers, not in so much in terms of commodities prices necessarily, but in terms of where China sources its, its raw materials from. Thank you, Michael. Now, uh, moving on to RCEP, Virginia, up to now, some businesses, you just mentioned, uh, based on global supply chains could be affected by tariffs, even when there was a free trade agreement in place because uh, the product had components made in other countries. So for instance, a product made in Indonesia uh, with parts from Australia could still be affected by tariffs under the RCEP. However, any component from any member country will be treated equal, which could give companies in RCEP countries an incentive to partner with the companies within the, the alliance. Yes. So this, this sort of will create a, um, a, a, a a club or, 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 or a potential for companies that outsource to other regions to start focusing on suppliers in, in, within, within the region. Do you expect a reaction to RCEP by the US and Europe to remain competitive uh, and, and not lose those markets? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's really fair. So it's 30% of the world's population 30% of world GDP, 40% of world trade. This is massive. This is the largest trade block in the world. Uh, and of course, it's probably been accelerated by uh, the policy uh, you know, in the past four years. Biden has actually commented on it already and saying that you know, we need to be back in the game. We can't let China dictate the trade in the Asian century in Asia, we have to be sitting at the table. So I think in terms of consequences, you're going to see with the new administration, much more diplomatic, going back to that diplomacy and trying to come in. Uh, clearly, we also have TPP. And you are really witnessing, witnessing a regionalization of the world. So you will have Americas, you will have Europe, and you will have Asia. Hopefully, 
we'll also have a global you know forum with wto that still functions but it's been uh, hurt in many ways so it is a it's a it's a new system i think ultimately it will be slower than what we expect. So I was uh, looking at some of the tariffs for Japan, for example. You know, Japan has always been very protective of its rice and its beef and all of that. Those tariffs are gonna come down much more slowly than uh, some of the other ones. So I think uh, it will have to be in the detail, but this is very, very important and, and the world needs to listen. Just, just an opportunity for me. Yes, Sorry, uh, just an opportunity for me to plug some of the, our recent research. Um, we, we've actually in the last week published a report uh, where we talked about the emergence of a tripolar economy, um, which is exactly what Virginie has, has, has just been describing. Um, and I think RCEP fits very clearly into that, into that situation. Um, so it's, uh, it's available on, on the Moody's website if you have access to the Moody's website. And it's, uh, uh, about the emergence of a tripolar economy. Worth reading. Thank you, Michael. Um, what approach should the American trade blocs, such as the Pacific Alliance or the, the Mercosur, take in, in this context? What about, or what about individual countries that have a tradition for true free trade agreements, such as Chile? Uh, what would be uh, the, the best approach for this uh, blocs and individual countries? I'll, I'll defer to Virginia on this one. We, we, as a policy, we don't give policy advice, so um, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Virginia. Okay. My, my, my view is uh, it really depends on the country. So if you're uh, a large exporter, I'm going to take Brazil, for example, to China. Uh, China is very important to Brazil, right? Uh, uh, I believe Argentina for meat is as well. You can't ignore uh, the Asia, Asia in the Asian century. So my advice would be either as part of a North American sort of delegation or uh, a regional, uh, you know, LATAM or a country bilateral, uh, whatever way it cannot be ignored and, uh, you know, discussions should be ongoing. Thank you. Um, Virgin, you mentioned that it's still some details to be known about RCEP, but some critics uh, say that despite all the noise, the, the trade agreement is uh, a li little ambitious and some activists are concerned about the lack of provisions to protect workers and the environment and that it may be negative for MSMEs uh, and farmers are in, which are in a very delicate position post-pandemic post -pandemic context. So what's, what's your view on that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, and that was one of Biden's point as well today uh, that, you know, this is the very high level. My understanding is that some countries still have to ratify it with their own public or, or you know, a government. So this is an idea, but it's not a fully, uh, a fully, a fully finalized uh, project. Uh, in terms of the environment, in terms of, as you say, SMEs or uh, farming, there's still a lot of details that needs to, uh, to take place. It's as if they really wanted to come out with the news uh, at the time of the transition in the US. That's my interpretation. Uh, first, you know, it's an eight year negotiation, so it's actually a very long time. But if they have reached that high level agreement, it was taking it out there as soon as Biden was to make sure that uh, there was a line in the sand. That is my view. And, and you know, it's actually not a bad thing uh, to bring people to the table with, with that in mind. Uh, but there's still a lot of details that uh, at least, you know, have not been published. It might still be worked on. Yeah, I guess some of the paradigm shifts that uh, have uh, pushed for stakeholder capitalism are going to start being seen in these in these negotiations as well, not only in the company front. Michael, is there anything else you would like to complement to, to Virginia's answer? Uh, no, I, I mean, I think obviously with uh, the original TPP uh, package, it was intended to, um, from a US perspective to provide um, some kind of uh, ring around um, China's trade policy 
uh, that it was you know, that it did contain those kind of protections of, of uh, workers rights and environmental protections uh, also limitations in terms of state-owned enterprises uh, was, a, was an important part of the, the TPP package so RCEP uh, obviously has a very different focus to those aspects of TPP um, I think RCEP is significant it's very it's a very significant development for reasons we've already talked about but also because this is the first major trade agreement the uh, first uh, major trade agreement in which the US is not a participant and, and that is a very significant departure from the past. So for a, I think for a, for a medium-sized economy like Chile's, uh, there is a, probably will be a, a choice in future between which trade, regional trade block do you align with most closely? Um, and I think for many medium-sized economies around the world, that's going to be a, a, an increasing choice that they'll have to face. That's a good point. I if I can just add one thing, um, clearly the, the big gap is also India, which uh, you know has decided not, not to be part of that. India, as we've seen, is going to be the largest country in the world. A lot of issues with climate, uh, clearly somehow a good foothold in technology. So there, there is a gap there that hopefully will be plugged. Uh, another thing is, you know, Again, thinking about sustainability, I would have loved if uh, you know RCEP uh, came out saying we'll be carbon neutral, all of us, <laughs> or the region overall by X date, and there's going to be tax advantage or there's going to be investment made in that. That would have been extremely powerful in terms of leadership. So not so much a taxonomy deal like Europe has done. But uh, something along the way, uh, you know, would have been really um, seen potentially as a model for the world, which would have been a big coup for China. Indeed, indeed. Um, I would like, before we wrap up the, uh, the, the, this very exciting webinar, I would like to jump on some of the questions that we have from the audience. And uh, the first has to do with some of the political uh, tension in, in the region. So what is, what is the risk of China, Taiwan tension escalation, and what would be the economic implications if that should occur? Any takers? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the China-Taiwan tensions are simply one of a number of regional flashpoints. I mean, if, if you look around Asia Pacific, uh, there are quite a number of, of potential flashpoints. Uh, whether we're talking about the Korean Peninsula, whether we're talking about the Taiwan and the Taiwan Strait, whether we're talking about South China Sea, or even to bring in India again, the, uh, the Himalayan border region between China and India. Um, so I, I wouldn't necessarily focus only on Taiwan. I mean, I think there are a number of geopolitical around the Asia Pacific Rim. Um, where I think the, the policy of the next US administration is going to be very important is in terms of whether it, it continues to maintain the security guarantees that have been one of the anchors of, of Asia's prosperity. Um, Effectively, over the last generation, Asian prosperity has depended on two main pillars. One of them has been a multilateral trading system. The other one has been US security guarantees. If either of those weaken, or if both of them weaken at the same time, that will be negative from the point of view of Asia's prosperity, undoubtedly. If I can just add um, to, to, to that, that again, during, during the past four years, uh, the dialogue with North Korea really didn't go anywhere. And uh, China historically has mediated between the world and North Korea. Uh, so I think uh, there is, I agree, there's the potential for, for an, an heightening or an increase in, in the risk. Uh, but at the same time, China still has some cards to play to mediate with, uh, with the rest of the world. Um, and, and the activities in the South China Sea really shows that she feels she's, uh, she's in power. And, and China generally is quite good at pushing things to the limit 
and then not going beyond that. Now, hopefully that will stay. Uh, but again, if you think of the next war being around artificial intelligence and the amount of money that uh, she's investing into that and how you can control very large territories uh, through, uh, particularly if you're the leader in, in some of that technology, uh, it's going to really change the way wars are done. And perhaps it's not an actual conflict, but it's another form of, uh, of control, right? And I, I, I think we'll be talking more about that over the next 10, 15 years. Good. Um, so we're running out of time. So I just wanted to give you a chance to uh, draw some uh, high level conclusions of what we have discussed around what's going on in, in Asia uh, from a long-term perspective, but also from the, uh, the, the developments that have occurred in, I'd say, the last four months, um, and, and how that translates into business opportunities, not only for investment purposes, but also for looking at China and, and establishing businesses in China. So uh, I'd like to wrap up this conference with uh, that sort of conclusion from each of you. Virginie, you may want to take uh, the, first, uh, the first conclusion. So, you know, I used to live in China in 1986, 87, and I've looked uh, at the evolution of the economy. And um, I have to say, it's actually very, quite ex extraordinary. It doesn't mean it won't be volatile, but the work that has been achieved uh, during that time is, is just amazing. So I am a very long-term investor in China. So in my personal portfolio, I've had position for 20 years. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe that the development of the bond markets, the equity markets, the themes that we've talked about means that it is a very strong area. Clearly valuation is important. So, you know, but, but this, this China is becoming uh, the largest power in the world it's going to be difficult for her to assume that power because the, that power has belonged to the US and China doesn't have the soft skills. It's part of its plan, right? How do I get better at soft skills? Um, one could say that Xi Jinping perhaps needs to uh, learn a little bit about the, because the way he's pushing the country has been very effective. Uh, so we'll have to see. And for me, what I'm going to look at is really what are those soft, that qualitative relationship that he's going to build with the new U.S. administration? And he has a leadership role to take in terms of COVID. He has a, where he can share things. He has a leadership role to take in terms of technology in some areas. And I hope he takes it. I hope he takes it. And the final thing I would say is, at the back of my mind, I've always thought that at some point, China needs to think about democracy. <laughs> now, not a democracy like we think about democracy. That transition from the current system to a Chinese kind of democracy that a lot of people want in China, that's going to be crucial to maintaining that superpower role, the number one uh, you know, power in the world. And um, I'm not clear that this can be achieved without much volatility, so we'll see. But at this point, uh, I think given the potential, you know, I'm, I'm an investor in China. Definitely. I, I think there's, there's uh, new generations that are going to demand things that uh, were not expected in the past. I don't know particularly in China, but that's, that's a global the global aspect. That, that's basically what gave birth to, to the stakeholders uh, uh, capitalism that, that is that is undergoing. Michael? Uh, yeah, uh, well, a, co a couple of additional observations to, to uh, round off with. I mean, the first one is a point I think I've already made in terms of the presentation, which is that Asia is going to continue to outperform most other major economic regions of the world. I mean, I used to have a line about it being the fastest growing economic region in the world until some of my colleagues started saying, well, no, Sub-Saharan Africa is growing faster. So it's the fastest growing major economic region in the world. Um, I think that's, that's going to remain the case post-COVID. I mean, I think many East Asian countries and governments have shown 
a, a very effective uh, policy in terms of dealing with the coronavirus outbreak. They've been very successful in terms of uh, containing the outbreaks. And uh, you, know, you, you look at countries like Korea, like China, like Vietnam, uh, you look at Taiwan, all of those places, they've, they've had very effective pandemic control, um, including also here in, in Singapore. Uh, so I think that illustrates the, the strength of government institutions across the East Asia, which hasn't necessarily been appreciated in the past. Secondly, that East Asia in particular, but if you take China, Japan and Korea together, they're 25% now of global GDP. Um, Asia's economic weight, I think, has been consistently underestimated, particularly by uh, analysts who sit in New York or who sit in, in one of the European capitals. Um, and, you know, when I go and have meetings with investors in those parts of the world, um, I'm constantly surprised by just how little they realize just how, how much economic weight uh, Asia now has in the global economy. And that, I think, is, is related to a third point, which is that there's still this tendency to treat many Asian economies as emerging economies. And I think that is a completely false narrative. China is just too large now just to see it as yet another emerging economy. It is, as Virginie pointed out in her presentation, on some measures now the largest economy in the world. You can't simply treat that as if it's another emerging economy. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, and then the, the final point is that financial markets in Asia haven't really caught up with Asia's economic weight. Uh, they're still relatively underdeveloped. Bond markets, although they've grown massively in China, are still relatively small compared to the size of the economy, certainly if you compare it to a Western European country or if you compare it to the US. So there's still a long way for um, Asia's financial markets to continue to grow and develop. Thank you, Michael. So I think that uh, it's a great way to finish a very exciting webinar. I, really, I can't thank you enough, Mike, uh, uh, Virginie, uh, for your participation today. It's been very informative, and I think everybody here in the in the audience would agree with that. So with that, uh, Luis, I don't know if you want to say a final closing word. So my on my side, thank you for the invitation, and once again, thank you, Michael, Virginie, for your participation today. Just to say thank you very much to all of you. It's been it's been a great honor to have you here. Uh, great panel, great conversation. I mean, uh, you guys gone through I mean, a lot of interesting issues, uh, all all relevant to to Chile, to to the world in general. So thank you, thank you very much, Michael. And remember, you have now the uh, interview with Asia Link here. So please remain logged in. Well, thanks thank everyone. Everybody. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting us and thanks for a great conversation. Thank you. Mm. Yes. Hold on a second, Michael. <laughs> Todavía hay 14 personas logueadas. Okay. Sí, esperemos un poco, Wendelin. Sí, no hay problema. Quizás que están esperando que We're just waiting for everyone reunión. to sign out, Michael. Um, uh, the Asia Link editor name is uh, Wendelin Ledger. Sí. Todavía 12. 